Today's lecture is going to introduce a product of vectors and its extension to a product of matrices. And to do so, we'll need another operation called the transpose. So let's first look at the operations that we have. The transpose, if we start with a matrix with indices i and j, what we are going to do is we are going to define the transpose to be the matrix that we get when we take the rows of a matrix A and make it into columns and vice versa. So in terms of the indices, what this does is it simply interchanges the indices of a matrix A. And an example here is I have a matrix with rows 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And the transpose has rows, therefore, 1, 4, 2, 5, and 3, 6, or equivalently columns 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6. The point to make is that the transpose lets us convert a row vector into a column vector. Remember, row vectors and column vectors are actually matrices, so they have a layout convention. So if I start with a column vector, the transpose is the corresponding row vector. And similarly, if I start with a row vector, the transpose is the corresponding column vector. Now that we have that, let's introduce the dot product. So suppose I have two vectors with the same number of entries. U has entries U1 through UK, B has entries V1 through VK. We define the dot product of u and v to be the sum of the products of the corresponding entries. So the dot product of u and v, written u dot v, is equal to the product of the first entries, u1, v1, plus the product of the second entries, all the way to the product of the last entries. So one thing to notice here is that we start with two vectors, and the dot product produces a scalar. In summation notation, we'll see that once in a while, not often, u dot v is simply the sum of the entries of u and the entries of v, and since they are the corresponding entries, the indices are the same. The sum of u i v i, where i runs from 1 to n. So let me give you three examples here. The first example is just take two vectors, 2, 1, 3, and 3, 5, 4, compute the dot product is equal to 23. The second example is supposed to show you that if you take two vectors individually, they are not zero. So the first vector is 2, 1, 3. The second vector is minus 3, 0, 2. And yet when I take the dot product, so a multiplication of two vectors, I get zero. The third example is also interesting and will come up a lot. The third example is I take a vector 2, 1, 3 and the second vector x, y, and z, and the dot product becomes what we will recognize as the left-hand side of the equation of a plane, 2x plus y plus 3z equal to whatever constant. I've also added a little coding example here. So the vectors 1, 2, 3, and 5 minus 1, 2, the dot product turns out to be 9, and then the last statement here is simply a check that that is indeed what I would get if I multiply it out by hand. Now, the matrix product next is simply a generalization of the dot product. And what we do is we get two sets of vectors, a set of vectors A, say A1 through M of these, AM, and a set of vectors B, and let's say we have N of these, so first vector B1, B2 through BN. And what we want to do is we want to systematically compute all of the dot products of a vector A with a vector B. To get that systematic is we'll list it in a table. So in my columns, I have the vectors A. In the row here, I have my vectors B. And the dot product of the A with the B will be at the intersection. So for example, here, A2 dot B2 appears at the intersection of the listing of the vector A2 and the vector B2. Once I substitute values into these vectors, it's going to make sense to write the A vectors as rows and the B vectors as columns so that we can put them in a nice grid. And I'll show you in a second. So here's the example. I have a vector A1 and A2 and vectors B1, B2, and B3. And when I write the A vectors in as rows, if I think of the A vectors as column vectors, then I'll have the transpose of the a1 vector, so the row 1, 2, that's my a1 vector, the row 3, 4, that's my a2 vector. And similarly for the b's, I will have the first vector as the first column in that vector b, so 5, 1 is the b1 vector, 
the B2 vector and the B3 vector in each one of these columns. And I'm going to lay out the computation exactly as shown in this table here. And so it's going to look like a matrix A times a matrix B producing a matrix C. Let's see what that looks like when I plug in numbers. So what I have is my column vectors B1, B2, B3. I'm writing them into this matrix here as columns. So 5, 1, 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0. The row vectors A, 1, 2, 3, 4, appearing on the right. And then the dot products of the individual entries, for example, 7 here, is the dot product of the A1 vector, 1, 2, with the B1 vector, 5, 1. So 1 times 5 plus 2 times 1 equal to 7. Uh, similarly, over here is this entry. That would be the dot product of the vector 3, 4, the A2 vector, with B2, with 3 minus 2. And the computation of that dot product yields 3 times 3 is 9, plus 4 times minus 2, 8 is equal to 1. In terms of code, to show you what that looks like, is I've got a matrix A and a matrix B, and in Julia, the multiplication is written as A times B. And when I do that computation, what I've done is I've written a little pretty print function that is at the very top of this notebook. It renders that multiplication exactly the way that I showed you that we would do in the computational layouts that we will use from here on out. A couple of remarks. Suppose I add or remove vectors, let's say, from the Bs. So I started with B1, B2, B3, and I want to end up with just B1 and B2. Well, the layout stays the same. It's just that the B3 vector has disappeared. And the B3 vector, the result appears right below the B3 vector. So in the result, those B3 entries have disappeared. Similarly, if I start with just two B vectors and I add a third vector, a B3 vector, all that really does is it adds a column to the B vector and to the resulting C matrix. So we see this as a partition. We see a line dividing the B vectors into two groups, B1, B2, and B3. And in the result, the result also gets divided into two groups, into the group that corresponds to the A vectors times B1 and B2, and the A vectors times B3. We can also do something similar with the A vectors. So suppose I take my original A vectors that I had up here and I add a third A vector. That third A vector simply adds another row to the result. So for example, if I have my original vectors, my A vectors 1, 2, and 3, 4, and I add the vector 2 minus 3, a third A vector, all that does in the output is it adds a third row in the output corresponding to the dot products of that third vector A3 with B1, B2, and B3. The definition of the matrix product then, written in terms of indices, I have a matrix A and a matrix B, and I want to compute the product C, and the entries of that product, the IJ entry, so for example, 12 is at row I equals 3, J equals 2, it corresponds to the A3 vector and the B2 vector. It therefore is simply the dot product, it's the sum of AIK and BKJ. AI is the ith row of the A matrix and therefore the AI vector, and BJ is the jth column of that B matrix and therefore the BJ vector. And the summation runs over the inner indices of those two matrix expressions. The row, therefore, each row of that matrix product C, over here, for example, this row, is computed from the corresponding row of A, from the row 1, 2. Similarly, each column of the product C, say minus 1, 1 here, is computed from the corresponding column of the B matrix, from the corresponding B vector. No other columns enter in that column product. And similarly, for a row in the output, no other rows of A enter in the computation of a row in the output. The other point to make, it's the inner indices that are summed over, and the result fits nicely into a rectangular grid. So the size of the result is the number of rows in A 
and the number of columns in B. So the size of a M by K matrix times a B K by N matrix is an M by N matrix. It's the inner indices that summed out. And note that for the product to exist, the number of columns of A, K, has to equal the number of rows of B, also K, because the dot product requires the same number of entries. There are a few special cases to point out. Uh, so they have to do with row and column vectors. And so here, let's look at the example first. If I take a row vector, so a matrix that has a single row, times a column vector, a matrix that has a single column, the result is the dot product of those two vectors written in a matrix. And since that's a single index, we can drop the indices and simply get the value 30 out of that result. So if I think of u and v as column vectors, then u transpose v turns out to be simply the dot product of u and v. Some computer languages, such as MATLAB and Julia, automatically convert between vectors and column vectors and between one-by-one one matrices and scalars. The other example, the opposite example, is if I start with a column vector u and multiply it with a row vector. Then, remember, it's the dot product of the rows of A, the rows of A has a single entry in it, 2, times the corresponding column vector in B, it also has a single entry, 3, and the dot product therefore simply works out to 2 times 3, and there are no further entries, so 6. The product of a column vector times a row vector, therefore, is a matrix of size, the number of entries in U, times the number of entries in V. And as you see, those vectors do not have to have the same number of entries. And therefore, the uh, product here, if I think of these as column vectors, is a column vector U times the transpose of the column vector V. This is called the outer product of two vectors. And in terms of a little code example, I get the output that I expect. Let's look at other cases, namely matrices times column vectors and matrices multiplied with row vectors from the left. So consider the matrix A with entries 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and the vector X as column vector with entries X1, X2, X3. And let's multiply out A times X. And what we see when we do that is, well, the rows of A multiply the columns of B, so that's the inner product that gives me the left-hand side of the equation of a plane. Similarly, the next row, 4, 5, 6, gives me another left-hand side of a plane, and that will prove useful in what we'll do next. Now, if I look at the product in terms of the columns of A, the 1 here is multiplied by x1, and so is the 4. So 1 and 4 are multiplied by x1. 2 and 5 are multiplied by x2. 3 and 6 are multiplied by x3. So I can look at this in terms of the column view equations that we had, that what I see if I partition the A matrix vertically, if I partition it into columns, I see x1 times the first column, plus x2 times the second column, plus x3 times the third column, coming in as the result of the matrix. I see my row view in the example above, and my column view in the example below of an expression of a linear combination of vectors. So an easy way to realize why this works that way is to simply take our definition of the product and pull out the first term. So pull out the k equals 1 term. And then I see the column of the a's times a corresponding entry in the b vector plus the remaining terms. So that says we can also partition the a matrix vertically. A very special case that we are going to use again and again is that if I partition a single row of the a matrix, so I simply take the vector 3, 4, 2, 
And I want to know what happens with three, what happens with four, what happens with two. The, the second matrix, I've simply made it a sum of entries here. The three is going to multiply the first row, is going to multiply A1 plus A2. The four is multiplying B1 plus B2. And the two is multiplying C1 plus C2. So what I see is three times the first row of, of matrix B plus four times the second row of matrix B plus two times the third row of matrix B. So I can think of the entries here as an instruction set on how to form a linear combination of the rows of the second matrix. Three times the first row, plus four times the second row, plus two times the third row. So let's talk again about the general rule. So I want to compute A times B and get the output C. My numerical layout is going to be keeping A on the left, offsetting the B matrix on a rectangular grid and writing the product AB at the intersection of the A and B matrix. And what we've seen is a couple of important points, namely that we can partition that multiplication. So if I want to draw a horizontal line, that horizontal line will go through two matrices, the A matrix and the C matrix. If I give names to each of the pieces that I then see, I have the first part of the A matrix, A1, will multiply into B and give me A1, B. The second part of the A matrix, the next set of rows in A's, gives me A2 times the dot product with each of the B entries, so A2 times B. So I can draw a horizontal partitioning line through two matrices, the A matrix and the C matrix. I can also partition vertically. If I draw the vertical partition, it again goes through two matrices in my product. And giving the components names, I see a first set of B vectors in the B1 matrix, a second set of B vectors in the B2 matrix. And the product has A times the dot product with the B1 vectors and A times all the dot products with the D2 vectors. So again, I can draw a vertical line through two matrices and give the components names and multiply them out that way. Now, the last example that we had with the X vectors, I could also draw vertical lines through the A matrix and therefore horizontal lines through the B matrix. And again, giving them names, what we see is that A multiplied with B1 plus A2 multiplied with B2, that is how I'm going to compute the output, the C matrix. So I can draw a vertical line through A and a horizontal line through B. Again, those partitioning lines go through two matrices. And for this to actually work, the number of columns in A1, so how many entries I have as I go from left to right, has to equal the number of rows in the B1 matrix, namely how many rows I have, because I have to have the dot products working out. They have to have the same number of entries. So what we see is that the sizes of the submatrices that we get that way must be consistent, and those matrix products must exist. And the other point to make is that the order of the entries in a matrix product must stay the same. So the A's were on the left and the B's were on the right in the product A times B. And therefore, they have to stay to the left and the right when I look at the individual components. So A1 is on the left, B1 is on the right, A2 is on the left, B2 is on the right. And we'll show example of that when we investigate a little bit more. Now, we can add partition lines. Once I partition a matrix into a submatrix product, I can just keep going and draw more and more lines. And so the point we had made before, where I looked at an instruction set, if I take my A matrix and it has more rows than before, but I pull out a particular row and I want to look at what the numbers do individually in that row, and therefore I introduce partition lines so that as to isolate each entry in that row, and I look at the multiplication of this A times a vector B, then when I set that up, I see that the product turns out to be the vertical partitioning line force a horizontal partition line in the B vector for each one of the rows. The output is in the corresponding row of the B matrix, and it's equal to 
three times the first row of that B matrix plus four times the second row plus two times the second row. It's this linear combination of the rows of the B matrix, of the second matrix. So if we subdivide the first matrix into columns and rows, each row in the result is a linear combination of the rows of that second matrix. And the numbers that appear here in that first matrix, 3, 4, and 2, they are the multipliers of that linear combination. So we think of that as an instruction set on how to produce a new row from the rows of B. This new row in particular is 3, 4, 2, multiplied into the B vector. A different set of rows, say if I wanted to have 1 times row 1 plus 1 times row 2 plus 1 times row 3, it would be 1 times row 1, 1 times row 2, 1 times row 3 to give me that result. So I'd like to invite you to test your understanding by considering what happens with a column of the matrix B. So take your matrix B and isolate each one of the entries in a column. And what that will have to do, of course, it will partition the A matrix into columns and consider what that does and give an example of such a computation. Finally, a notation convention. Whenever we have a vector U, we will consider it to be a column vector when we make it into a matrix. We might have some exceptions, but we'll state that specifically. So U will always be a column vector when we consider it as a matrix. Therefore, U transpose will be the corresponding row vector. If I look at U transpose times V, that's going to be the inner product of U and V, so the dot product of the vector U with the vector V. And U V transpose, column times row, will be the outer product of the vectors u and v. The takeaway then is that we've seen a couple of operations. We've seen the transpose of a matrix. We've seen the dot product of two vectors. And we've seen a generalization of the dot product to the matrix product. The other part that we saw is that the consequence of that definition is that if we look at the matrix product, we can partition it. We can look at, in particular, how entries in a row of A describe how to compute the product in terms of the rows of B. And partitioning lets us see which entries in a matrix affect which entries in the result.